you were well on our way. Oh. <laughs> Hi, so if you are looking for the We Were Already Here panel, congratulations, you're already here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, my name is Cassie. I'm going to be your um, moderator panelist of this panel. Um, we will have a little bit of time for Q&A um, towards the end, but we're going to start off this panel with having uh, the panelists introduce themselves as well as positionality. Um, so it's going to sound like this. Hi, my name is Cassie. I also go by Lamia. My pronouns are they, them. I am a black, queer, um, American-born person who comes at this work from the positionality of a decolonial and liberatory um, mental health practitioner as well as activist. Um, I also do want to acknowledge that we are on stolen land. Um, a lot of times land acknowledgement statements are kind of BS because of the fact that uh, the organizations that frequently do them, like land grant universities, then do nothing to give the land back. <laughs> the point of these statements is not just acknowledgement. If I steal your house, and say, oh man, this is a stolen house. What a shame. And then I continue to live in your house. That is meaningless. So just an acknowledgement there. Uh, so that is me. This panel is going to be a frank discussion. We are likely to curse because this work is a lot. And sometimes there is nothing that truly gets the emphasis across like a good fuck. So, do be aware of that, please. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and just going straight down the line, have my panelists introduce themselves. So, Nordin Ali, if you'd like to start. Hello, my name is Nordin Ali Kabir. You can call me Nordin, Nordin Ali. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I come from this as, uh, well, a queer Muslim person who's also a sensitivity and cultural consultant and a writer who focuses a lot on horror and how horror can represent both the best of us and the worst of us. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tanya, also known as Sacro Tear. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm coming from this as a US born cisgender femme uh, black person, and also as someone who grew up watching things like Star Trek, um, Star Wars, and things without seeing myself in them. Basically, the only time I saw black people in media was as servants, as pimps, as hookers that didn't last more than five minutes into the media. And uh, come with this also as a creator, creative director of Into the Motherlands, which Cassie also worked on, and tired of not seeing myself except as a dot, and often a very quickly erased dot in media. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know if this is on. It's, 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 it's already good. good. Just pull it towards uh, you. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Emrys, my pronouns are they, them. I am a uh, queer, non-binary, uh, black woman, a West Indian heritage. I'm unfortunately born in uh, what is allegedly the US on the very independent nation of Puerto Rico. Um, I am coming at this as a uh, liberation focused mental health counselor of almost 10 years as well as a community activist uh, and organizer of, I think, seven years at this point. I'm also one of the uh, moderators of the Historically Black Guy Society Discord server. Um, and I am probably one of the uh, newer uh, gamers on this panel, um, having recently gotten into tabletop gaming, uh, like a year and a half ago. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs> The, everyone knows the best gamers are the newest gamers, so yeah. obviously it's incredible. Uh, hello, I'm Eric Silver, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I come into this uh, as a Jew, as an anti-Zionist Jew, uh, and I'm so happy that I get to be a part of this panel and, and be a part of the intersectionality here. Um, I've been working in actual play and in tabletop for a, very, for a long time uh, as the DM of Join the Party, um, and also as a game designer. Uh, I'm very, I'm just very excited to be here. <laughs> and with that, I also want to acknowledge that uh, there is clearly a glaring gap in our panel makeup because of scheduling uh, conflicts and things, and I want to acknowledge that we do not at this moment have a uh, North American Indigenous panelist. And so that is a, um, that is a gap in our panel makeup today, and I want to go ahead and speak to that because 
part of decolonial work is owning when something is not perhaps everything someone expected or wanted it to be, um, and not hiding what things are. So when we talk about coloniality, um, and we use terms like colonialism, settler colonialism, what we are talking about are systems and structures that are pervasive and foundational to what we live in. Settler colonialism specifically is a kind of colonialism <clears throat> which views land and people and interweaves a lot with capitalism in our modern world um, as things to be taken and owned, right? When we talk about theft of land, that requires land to be able to be something to be owned, right? So as we go through this panel and we are talking about themes of colonialism and all of the, we won't get to all of them, there's a lot, uh, and many of the ways that it is in our games and in the games we see, in the games people are making and playing and the actual plays and storylines that folks come up with, those are kind of the definitions and the overall gist and shared understanding I want y'all to have. So, we're gonna start off this panel by asking the, the evergreen question of, what's your least favorite colonial trope in games? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. We're starting off hot, folks. <laughs> Terrorists. Want to say more? Well, okay. <laughs> 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 I have to, or just get it across. Well, yeah. a lot of people. Okay, here's the thing. I understand that not everyone can sign on to the idea of armed rebellion or of marginalized people who've been pushed down to the point they need to fight back. However, when we use the word terrorist, what we're doing is condensing all of it, all the various different kinds, good and bad and neutral, into one thing that we can hate. By calling a thing that we don't like terrorism, we reduce what the as actual aspect of trying to cause terror in a population is. And on top of it, we're doing it to marginalized people who frankly have kind of been through enough. I've been called a terrorist on the street just for, even without the scarf, just like walking around, you know, since I've been a kid. It's practically a slur to me these days. When it comes down to it, it does nothing to the conversation to call any group, even if you don't like them, even if your players are not supposed to like them, even if the world doesn't like them, a terrorist, even if they're part of the majority. Because at the end of the day, they are more than that. What are they specifically trying to do? And I think that's one of the ways we break colonialism, is that we take all of these tropes and we narrow them down to specifically what they're supposed to be, instead of the generic term that is used to encompass all sorts of groups and mean practically nothing. Slavery. Hmm. Too many games want to have a slavery theme subclass. There, there was a time when I saw someone trying to advocate for a subclass of slave master in forums of a company that I have worked for, and we fixed that. Because too many people, both in real life and in the fantasy settings and sci-fi settings to try to build, think that slavery is perfectly fine. What do you mean we can't have slaves? Why, why would we not have that? And then my soul leaves my body. <laughs> uh, because Just because I'm light does not mean that I'm not black. We get that a lot, that if you're not of a certain shade of brown, you're not really black, you must be mixed, or you're, you just don't understand. And I was like, oh no, I'm old enough to have had effigies hanging in the backyard as a kid. I grew up on the south side of Chicago and we still had that. So when people say that we must have slavery, we must have these kinds of things in games, Spoiler, you do not, because it guarantees I will never talk to you again or never play with you or other marginalized people, because slavery is not simply a U.S. black thing. It is a global thing. Okay. Can I a, give an example for this, which surprised me, considering how it feels uh, like this? Not, let's let Emerson go first. Oh, sorry, I meant to, oh. to build on what you're saying. Oh, well, yeah. I just want to make sure. Oh, I'm sorry, no, please. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. To, oh, if, you're, I guess, if you're building to, on that point. To building on that specific point. Yeah. I guess it's like, if you think it's gone, like, that was a major plot point in Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> like, I'm yeah, still no. so surprised about yeah, that. Yeah, we're when... going to get to Baldur's Gate specifically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm specifically. So, yeah. 
first. <laughs> go ahead first. Um, you know, I, I knew this question was coming, and honestly, I, when I was thinking about how do I want to answer this question, the thing that jumps into my mind is something that I say a lot to people when I'm talking about, you know, media and colonialism, and it's that growing up is realizing that Indiana Jones was the bad guy, right? Yes. <laughs> well, so, Indiana right, Jones. This idea of like, oh, we have to go steal, you know, retrieve this magical artifact from these like temple or mysterious ruins or you know these barbaric you know savage or whatever people and you know whatever like that whole kind of thing you know where you're like going to retrieve this magical stone or this magical amulet or whatever the hell it is and fight your way in and then you have to fight your way out like that whole vibe is just like no right and it's everywhere like even in games like temple run right it's like this is white people going in there and y'all stealing these people shit and we supposed to help you run away <laughs> from the people who shit you're stealing like and it's just it's something if a switch really flips in your mind when you when you want when you grow up and you realize that like wait like Indiana Jones is the bad guy in every conceivable way that he could possibly be a bad guy, right? Like, not only is he an a white archaeologist who makes his living stealing indigenous artifacts and selling them to the British Museum, he also is a predator uh, who preyed on a teenage girl and then abandoned her. Like, he's just a bad man in every possible way, right? But in media, he is like a hero character. And in game, like there's so many different types of games, whether that's video games, you know, like tabletop games that center characters like him as the protagonist character, as the hero character. And it's really wild because that's like one of the most insidious forms of colonialism, right? Which is the neo-colonialism. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the trope that I dislike the most because people literally fight for their lives to defend that right it, as a thing and they, it's it's like trying to get people to understand like that is bad is so challenging uh so i think that's it for me and just to build off that uh who likes the mummy oh yeah the that too mm -hmm. well, I, so uh the mummy's the hero of that movie <laughs> It's the karma of the people they're stealing from. It like, yeah. So just, just new way to watch the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eric, mine would be that every fantasy religion is just Catholicism. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, you have three things that all come together as your religion. Huh. Cool. Never heard of that. You have like a pontifex. That's a cool word. Never heard of that one. Oh, we're gonna do something. We're all gonna go out and like hurt someone else because we like our religion the most, and even the bad guys. It's cool. Um, I always say that like the person that enjoys fantasy the most, you have to be a lapsed Catholic in that like <laughs> you don't like going to church anymore, but you get it. Like you know what a catechism is. I don't know what any of this stuff is. I have to ask people, and I'm like, am I supposed to understand how this works? I think this is also part of what was said before is like as it's tied to terrorism, for what you said about that it's even if you're part of the majority, it's like, well then it's like, oh, then it's mixed with Christianity or the religion that it, or the uh, deity that is making them do the terrorists is then intentionally other because it's like the fantasy, the fantasy Catholicism and the fantasy other religion. So it's how these things are all tied, how all these things are tied together and compared to each other. Yeah, it's a it's a great way to like take somebody who's part of the majority and say, oh no, they're they're not like us. They're like the savages, right. uh, which is you know problematic in and of itself. I'm now wondering what your opinion on uh, Judeo-Christian values are. Ooh. Oh, that shit's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Get your shit away from me. I didn't co-sign any of that. <laughs> it's not me. I like me. I like God's new old stuff. I don't like his new stuff. <laughs> No, I only listen you're, to the old hits. You're a god hipster? Yeah, I'm a god hipster. <laughs> yeah, when he grew the beard, 
Rupert, it's like, nah, I don't relate to them anymore. <laughs> Look, I would have opinions, but according to that term, I don't exist. Yes, so. of course. <clears throat> yeah. I'm just brought along for the ride. I'm in the backpack. But like everything everyone's saying is very resonant. <laughs> So, so I want to go ahead and move us along by uh, sharing my least favorite so that we can open this up of, I absolutely adore with a seething rage the, oh my god, we're going to discover a new land that already has temples and castles and treasure <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, there's, there's nothing here but these monsters we're fighting is my favorite trope of colonialism and i'm wondering how folks are feeling about what it means for games to prevent present the trope of discovering the new world that is filled with ruins so that's really interesting for me. So like when I, as I mentioned in my intro, I'm one of the mods of the Historically Black Dive Society uh, Gaming Discord, which is like all black, all time uh, gaming Discord server. And when I joined the server, you know, just as a, you know, black folk looking for other black folk, um, I literally went on Twitter and I was like, I'm a black person trying to play D&D, like where are the niggas? And uh, they replied to my tweet, and they were like, we're over here. And I was like, let's go. So when I joined that server, one of the first you know, games that I played in that server was actually um, a really awesome you know, game where it was like, oh, you know, we're on this land. We have our various you know, kind of tribes that we come from. We all coexist. We're like fighting this tyrant who's trying to like you know, wipe everybody out, make everybody enslaved. And it's like, you know, a very kind of like, you know, colonialism is the bad guy. And then, you know, as we're, you know, it, the campaign starts, we're all coming home from, you know, having defeated that person. And then our encampment gets attacked by these creatures. And the DM is describing these creatures that we've all never seen before. And he's like, yeah, they have this weird, like, pale yellowish skin and this hair that's really, you know, like a, the color of straw and it's like nothing you've ever seen before and like the way he's describing the characters and the, the bad guys i'm like what the fuck monster is this i'm like flipping through the digital like monsters guy like what the fuck is this and then eventually you know he starts describing like oh and then their clerics appear right and still are casting spells with this strange you know like uh arcane focuses and i was like this is white people <laughs> Set up this whole thing, which is like being able to uh, resisting colonialism as the entire premise of this campaign. And I was playing a barbarian for the first time, and when I tell you that was easily one of the most enjoyable combats I've ever played um, ever in my life. I had so much fun in that campaign. Like it was really heavy. Obviously, it was a really uh, like challenging, but the way it was described, it was very much, you know, the world building was really solid. Um, and it was being able to have an experience of like, oh, these people think they're gonna come and take all your shit, right? And we have these narratives in our uh, society, especially in the US, that like manifest destiny, you know, and all that stuff is like, oh, this land was all empty and they went and they took it over and, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, no, like there were people there and they fought back, right? And that there was a, a hey, brutal conquest. Let's... Sorry, I'm, obviously I have a lot of feelings, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but I yeah, think but we're gonna that, guess, we're gonna yeah. make sure to give some of the other panels yeah. a chance. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop. Cause we could go I'm all day. I'm getting very nervous right now. I'm getting very nervous, divergent. I'm, I'm gonna bring it, I'm gonna bring it. All right, <laughs> so who else, who wants, wants a crack at this one? Or has thoughts off the Mrs. story? I have thoughts about it. First, I need the server address. How you holding out on somebody? Yeah, you are cold. Okay, I got you. I got you. I got you. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about it when Amherst was talking because um, for those who don't know, I was on Rivals of Waterdeep, which was an all POC sponsored for most of our duration show for D&D. &D. But what we did was we're all brown people and for like one glorious season it was all black people. I, 
I don't know how that happened, but it did. But what we did was we took the things in D&D and subverted them. We made references that other people of color were gonna get. You know, when we, and we just flat out said, are you, are you being a colonizer right now in some of these moments? And one, some people were weird about it because D&D nerds, I'm just gonna say it, including myself, some of us can be really pedantic and nerve grating. Okay, I see some heads nodding, and I see some people looking like they want to argue. Because <laughs> if you want to fight me, we can go there. Um, but, but the other part of it is, is making it to the motherlands. You know, and I also, I'm so sorry, Norton worked on it too. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm very tired. Um, but you know, the, the whole conceit was, we didn't go to a planet and take it over. It was descendants of Mansa Musa who got lost. Historically, they did just get lost somewhere. But we said, they actually wound up on this planet that is totally made up. And they integrated into the society rather than yep. taking it over. Now granted, people want to argue, but you're still a colonizer. I'm like, please tell me how we're colonizing by integrating. There's a difference, go get a dictionary. Um, and that was one of the things because a lot of us, again, grew up with not seeing ourselves in, in media, in other things like, you know, I love original Star Trek, original Star Wars, everything else, but we, again, we're not present. So those are the things where here's a chance to make something where we get to tell the story, we get to drive the narrative. And instead of it just being, oh yeah, there's some brown people over there in some place we're going to see once and never talk again. Much as I love The Witcher, that's what they did with Eric Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, we are the people in charge. And yes, there's non-humans, there's other species, that, and we also got rid of race, we say culture, etc. So doing those things of, we integrated, we did not take over, and that's where the story begins. Can I share spoilers from Motherland? Of course. Cool. So uh, I actually, I used Motherlands in order to also um, remake what mental health is and means. As, and because that's something like how you relate to wellness, especially psychological and mental and spiritual wellness, is it something that's really in a lot of games? And if it is, it's a very uh, white colonial Western uh, way of thinking. And so Motherlands actually has a um, mental health like healer uh, that has a spiritual piece to it because black conceptualizations of psychology and the mind include a spiritual component. Um, Pan-African conceptualizations, I should say. And so that's also something like that I like looking at is the conceptualizations of not just um, not just the mind, but also the holistic system of a person is something that is a deeply colonized concept of like what it means to be a person, what it means to be a person in a group, and the collectivist or individualistic bent of a game is a thing. And so I wanna open several categories of possibility here, as well as if you didn't get a chance on our previous topic, but this, this idea of what games, conceptualizations of mind, spirituality, and religion look like as related to the white settler colonial norm that is individualistic and culturally Christian. Yeah, oh man, that does, what you're talking about collectivism is so, is an individuality. Because again, when you're playing D&D, the way that the game works is like, you are important people, like great men, who show up and like do your thing and then everyone's like, oh my God, great, thank you so much. And then you give them all their stuff and then you level up and everything, right? And it doesn't have anything to do with the, like the relationship to the people who are in the space in the first place. And like on top of everything we're saying, this shit's boring. Mm -hmm. This shit's just boring. Like, oh, I'm gonna go somewhere and then do hell and show everyone that I'm better. It's just this power fantasy that we've been talking about in video games and tabletop RPGs, but the real power fantasy we want is like, man, what if I like could own a house? <laughs> <laughs> or like, what if I had a stable community that cared about me? Like that makes a lot more sense for what we want than what the game is serving us and what the game was built with 
when it started, and uh, especially in a lot of the games that we play outside of Dungeons and Dragons, and the IP created uh, within Dungeons and Dragons, and other and other games, and other video games out there. It's really interesting to bring up Dungeons and Dragons. Obviously, we have to. Sorry, <laughs> did we? <laughs> and, uh, it's one of the best examples of how the tone can be set from the ground up, mm -hmm. and like it or not, Dungeons and Dragons set the tone for what tabletop is today. Mm -hmm. But one of the funniest things about Dungeons and Dragons is the first thing everyone tells me, especially my fellow queer people, hello, uh, is that one of the things they love about Dungeons and Dragons is the found family aspect. Yeah. And that's wonderful. It's not in the book. It's not in the book. It's something that you're doing at the table, right? So if we, when we say Dungeons and Dragons has aspects of found family, we're in a way kind of lying and papering over what Dungeons and Dragons is in favor of what we want it to be and what we try to make it be. When we do that, it, it, it does this thing where sometimes people are like, no, but Dungeons and Dragons is, is, is great. It's all about like finding the people that matter to you, finding your community. When, no, that's because you at the table are doing that yourselves. That's wonderful, that's your work. Mm -hmm. You did that, take credit for it. Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons is about like collecting XP, living a, power fan, living a power fantasy, and doing a lot of tactical combat. It's its own thing. And if we don't acknowledge that, we don't acknowledge the inherent power structures within Dungeons and Dragons that are replicated all over tabletop, even in those games that are, we're, we're redoing Dungeons and Dragons, but we're doing it better. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just the same thing, but with more generic names and still a large amount of racism. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, to, to build on that, I think it's interesting of the way that the game Dungeons and Dragons and the IP or company of Dungeons and Dragons, how close they, they will all have the same name. Like the game does the thing, but then it's like, do we see it is an imagination machine, right? Like I, we're gonna do it and we're gonna have to follow these rules. But then it's like the story I'm telling, then people associate the actual play you make with the game, but no, you should, and the game they do at their own table. Exactly what you're saying is like, then they end up getting confused and then once the IP, now that Hasbro has pivoted to IP creation, as they've said in their quarterly, y'all should read those, those are <laughs> true. So they pivoted to IP creation and what we see in the Dungeons and Dragons movie and in Baldur's Gate 3, like, it's actually not an imagination machine. Now they have a responsibility because they're telling us that the, for, the thing that we have is, the thing that we have actually you should follow this, but then it has all of the problems that are actually baked into that book and it is not the thing you are doing at the table or the actual play that you are watching and love. Um, I think when we make, when I make actual play, I have a lot of response, I feel a lot of responsibility to that and I do the play, make the table I wish that everyone else had. Um, and because of, it's going to be people's gateway to playing the game as the IP is pushing it to be that gateway to the game so that they can give them money and stuff. So we're yeah. here. To circle back to your point about spirituality though. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm just thinking of like encounters that I've had. So obviously, or maybe not obviously, but I'm gonna say obviously when I started playing with Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I was navigating mostly like, you know, uh, you know, cis digital spaces because I started playing like during, you know, the last three years. And I remember the point at which I realized that like I was operating on a different wavelength of imagination than mm -hmm. a lot of the people that I was gaming with mm -hmm. um, in terms of like my understanding of systems. Like I'm just thinking, for example, I played a Curse of Strahd uh, one shot where we were the bad guys. That was the whole conceit was that we were <laughs> evil aligned characters and Strahd had hired us to go into, you know, the, the town and to get rid of this cleric who was basically in the town, like rabble rouse, not really rabble rousing, but like trying to cheer the people up. I was like, I don't want these people to be happy. So go down there and get rid of, you know, get rid of that cleric guy, whatever. And we were like, that money is money, right? So, right, like I was playing specifically a evil uh, swamp siren bard, right? So we get into the town and we're-, we're The it, character's type. Oh, it was That's dope. Awesome. Um, that was the that was the campaign that I m almost made the DM cry. Um, in a nice get... way. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean in a nice way? In an, in, an, in an accidental way, but definitely not in a nice way. Because we get into the town, right? And so the whole thing is like 
the guy we're supposed to be getting, he's supposed to be the good guy character. He's like this paladin um, who's there in the town. You know, he's, you know, doing in the tavern, doing music, telling stories of his exploits and, you know, basically like, you know, trying to cheer the people up and whatever, blah, blah, blah. So we go into the tavern and we call him out and we're like, you know, you know, whatever. So he comes outside and, you know, my character is just super laissez faire, really focused on trying to bang Strahd, to be honest. And so like, <laughs> like let's wrap this up so I can get back to what I was doing. Um, and it's basically like, you know, the, the paladin knows we're, we're there for him. So he comes out and he's like, you know, whatever you gotta do, you know, my spiritual whatever is gonna protect me because I'm on a holy mission and blah, 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 blah. And my character basically like reads him for Phil from top to bottom and is basically like, you're here doing parlor tricks for these people who are living under like the oppressive cloud of straw. Do you think your parlor tricks are doing anything to make their lives materially better? Like you think you're doing something right now or are you jerking yourself off, right? By pretending that you're doing something to make these people's <laughs> lives better. This is not about making their lives better. This is about making you feel better. Right? Because if you were really about it, you would get your ass up there on that hill and go get shot. But no, you're down here playing cards and telling your glorious stories, which all happen to be about you, by the way. Right? And all the things that you've done and all the people that you've saved. And it doesn't mean fuck all to these people at the end of the day. Right? You're just a drop in a basket of their miserable lives. Right? You're not doing anything besides being self-aggrandizing. And then the rest of our party murdered him. But, um, but then after that, the DM like dropped, you know, the, the, the DM jumped in my DMs and was like telling me his whole life story about like, why was my PC so like antagonistic? I was like, we're the bad guys? Like you said, we're the bad guys. And you're asking me why my PC was so antagonistic to the good guy character. So I was like, all right. And you're like going on all of this and like trying to like justify it. And I was like, baby, you don't know the characters that you wrote because everything that I said was 100% factual. And if you're having feelings about that, that's a you problem, not me, right? But there's like this idea that even within the game, when you're playing evil characters, you're still supposed to somehow like be kind to the person that has been designated, specifically the white person that has been designated the good guy character. Like you're still supposed to buy into their like liberal conceit that they are making life better for people, even when they're not taking any steps to like make life materially better. And all they're doing is bringing their religion and imposing it upon people to like plaster over how shitty life is, right? And not doing anything to address so, the root cause. Yep. So as we're, I want to make sure we have a little time for Q and A. So as as promised, though, I promised it, so we're gonna do it. Yeah. Oh, this is my diatribe moment. Baldur's Gate. <laughs> it's a beautifully made game. It looks amazing. I've watched many people, including Tanya, do uh, character gen and all these things. And it's great. It's pretty. The music, mwah, beautiful. I will never play that game. A lot of times, I can't watch it because there is so much racism, slavery, and mess with no options to say anything. It is the definition of a status quo that does not allow for even the idea of speaking against it. And it's wild because then you see people online, all over the place, like, thirsting over characters and things, but then if you mention like, hey, you know it's really fucked up? The way tieflings are treated and the fact you can't say anything about it, they're like, I don't want politics in my games. <laughs> what? <laughs> excuse, fam, excuse. And, <laughs> and I think it's something that for me, whether we are talking video games or analog games, this panel has really well started the conversation of the point may not be to make a system changer game, but when you make a game and there is a choice to 
by and large have no means to change systems of coloniality that you have chosen to include, whether it is deep-seated racism and slavery, whether that slavery is racialized or based on other identity factors, um, whether that is ableism and showing no disability in the game, or showing disabled people is tragic in games and things, these are all connected. And when you have little to no commentary on that, it is an endorsement of that system. And I think when we talk about coloniality in games and when we open up questions here for a moment, that's a, little, a thing to, oh, well, that's great. Um, <laughs> so in case remember I, our names. Remember who we are, please. In case, in case my computer dies. Oh, oh. Oh. oh well. So <laughs> the point being that if we, <laughs> when we're answer, when we're asking questions, keep this in mind. Keep them concise, and we will cut you off because we have a limited amount of time. Uh, before we before we open for questions, however, I do want to give everybody a chance to do, uh, you know, last minute thoughts before we open it up for uh, a couple questions here. So I'm not I'm trying I swear to God I'm not trying to be the well actually person, but there is dialogue where you can't call out the NPCs about the racism. It yes. doesn't usually end well. Yes. It doesn't end well. <laughs> and I'm not arguing with you because I say this as someone who is a games writer as my day job. I love the writing in the game, but I played my first run as a drow. Even though, see, see, y'all know. <laughs> y'all know where I'm going with this. I made my character with a skin tone like Emrys. I wasn't even blue, gray, purple. The number of times I'm like, oh my God, a drow. You're, you're on the surface? And I'm like, yeah, you know we do go outside. <laughs> I wish I could have said that in character, but my brain is just like, draw were not so uncommon. But between people watching me play the game and the characters I run into going, oh my god, a drow, it was just hard to have that, I've been outside, I swear, and also with tieflings. I've not yet played a tiefling outside of playing one of the origin characters, and it's still the same thing. But on occasion, there are options that's not consistent. Yeah, and I think that's what got me, because obviously you're one of the main people I've seen playing it while I'm modding, and I'm just like, yikes. Oh, it's absolutely life, and I am not excusing, because also remember, a human being put the words in these characters' mouth. Yep. yep. So a lot of people are like, but, but Astarian, or this character, or Will is poorly written, or what have you. First off, you need to remember an actual human because again, as far as I know, tieflings and vampires and other things are not real. If you think they're real, that's between you and whatever you believe in. Um, but I think people conflate the fact, and the deal with TTRPGs as well, is that your moral alignment matches what you do in a game. Yeah. I am a terrible person in Baldur's Gate. I murdered the whole group. Yeah, I did it. I wanted Minthara. <laughs> <laughs> but that does not mean I'm going to go out and actually slaughter a bunch of people because I want to go bang somebody. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, no, I, I'm not actually that terrible person. I'm black. They would, they would shoot me on sight. I wouldn't make it to a trial. <laughs> but you know, that's the other part of it too. Is that you know, a lot of people view they they get too invested in. I saw you be a terrible person, or you're playing this character that's evil or a colonizer or whatever. So you must be that. And I'm like, did you forget that I'm black? <laughs> uh, that you know, that's not how that works. I don't have the power to do these things. Because a lot of people that will be mad or say, well, where's white people in motherlands or what have you? Hello, I don't have the institutional power or ability to be a racist. Please go get a dictionary. Go outside, go take some classes, go do something. So that's the other part of it is that people conflate the choices you make at the table in a video game, what have you, and also that these characters are not real life people. They are video game characters. When you shut your console off and you close the game, they cease to exist until you boot it back up. Yeah. 
questions. <laughs> well, did anyone else have any last second so my things? thing that I wanted to say, which is the flip side of that, which is the fact that the, the people at the table who are marginalized, regardless of the way that they are marginalized, and those of us who are multiply marginalized, we can tell when you are using your PCs to act out your real life fantasy. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. I can tell when someone is writing, right, artistically a bad character and when they are simply acting in a way that they would act if they had the means to act that way in their real life and that they probably act that way to some degree already, right? The, well, this is what my character would do in game is not a good excuse to be an asshole, right? And furthermore, we don't buy it, right? We don't buy it. Every choice that you make at the table is a choice that you are making at the table. Your character is not real. They are fake. They will not do anything unless you will it. Right? So when you are making choices, one, narratively, you have to be able to back those choices up because I will ask you why. And two, right, if the explanation is not acceptable to me, I will also tell you that, right? Because I think a lot of people use okay. their characters to traumatize people at the table and act out horrible bigotry and then be like, well, it's fake, so you shouldn't be <laughs> triggered right now. And no. I'm not thinking of people as like having a sock puppet. When they're, when they're at the game, it's like literally exists for themselves. True. Yeah. Do we have a mic, by the way, for the audience? There is one thing that I um, I think it's important to add as someone who's like worked in a consultation field before, and I have a lot of people talk to me. They often I'm brought at the end of the project, which sucks, and not asked to write anything, which sucks even more. But anyway, yeah. perfection is the thing that we may strive towards. We're not going to achieve it. It is best that you still try. Because at the end of the day, we have all, at this table, all of you, everyone at this convention, everyone on the planet has accidentally hurt someone we didn't intend to. We will all do it. Best to aim to not, and if we fail, at least we know, hey, now I know what I can specifically learn from to not do it again. It is a mistake to choose either continuing the, the harm or even worse, just erasing all the mistakes you made without acknowledging how those mistakes have been re-opted by you know, the people of color that you supposedly were trying to represent. I feel a lot of games that uh, set place in the real world tend to do this, where the response nowadays is just, let's just flatten the playing field. We made these terrible racialized assassins before. Now they're not assassins anymore. They're just people who are there and they have no interest, and you who saw yourself in them and tried to reclaim them, just go somewhere else. Go, go somewhere else. That's not an accurate response. Better to try and fail than just not bother. And that's what I'm upset about. Great. So, we're gonna take a few questions. Uh, um, can, I, can I say one last thing before we while, go? While people are writing up. Yes, yes, yes. we're running out of time. For sure. So, questions. Please be concise. Please know if you come with, like, stories or corrections instead of questions, I will stop you and ask you to sit down in the interest of time. Thank you. Um, the last thing is people usually dismiss this by saying it's just a game, get over it. Um, it's a game so everyone should be having fun. If you're doing something that hurts someone else, what are we doing here? What literally, what's the point? So it's like you are literally, the, we are all people playing a game, we're here to have fun and feel safe and have a good time. Like that's why it's important. That's why we're here saying this hurts. Please help us. And you can do that at your own table, and we, can, we do it on a larger scale when we make actual play and publish the games that we do. Hi. Hi. So I'm starting a game based on a pre made adventure path soon that pretty heavily features themes of colonialism and empire. Do you have advice for how to approach adjusting those themes and decolonizing the work between like adapting the themes, excising them, or just giving up on the work? I mean... I have a question, but it may, I'm not I trying to- I think you have the same question I have, go ahead. Same here. Why do you need to make a game of colonialism? I mean, Why can't you make a game that does not have that? We, right. This whole hall is filled with games full of colonialism. You don't need to make that. That's kind of my question, yeah. To be clear- Then don't. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, so, okay, I have a prop. Oh, so, yeah. props. Oh, props. There's props. I read a lot. There are entire books filled with talking about how there are 
too many colonial games. From Settlers of Catan, to D&D, to everything in between and other ones. Like, this is one book. I have like, I could have packed, I could have overfilled my suitcase with books about oppression and colonialism in games. And so I think it's also a point of like, if you don't have a really good reason and a really good new take that no one has done, there are, let me see if I can find it real quick. The, uh, there was a record number of games. That when they were writing this book, they went to the big, huge uh, game conference over in Germany, and there they basically, they ran out of room because there was a record number of games with themes of colonialism that were not actually like interested in talking about it or doing anything interested in it. They just had colonial, Mech, like game mechanics and it's grow it's still growing so if if you're doing that like you're just kind of part of a crowd and you're doing a thing that is actively what we're asking to stop doing so if much of. if there's something you love in it take that put it somewhere else okay yeah like make like you're you're an adult make the game that you're gonna make but yeah. also know that like you may end up in a book as an example of what you want to do. I used to be at the point where it's like, if you're gonna put a Nazi in the game, at least let me punch the Nazi. But at this point, I'm like, why are they even there? Yeah. I'm just tired of it. Like, it's not like there's enough of them out here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to add on to your point about using Nazis as the stock bad guy, they've kind of just become a nebulous bad guy for you to punch. If anyone wants to talk to me about what, about uh, adding like weird magics to Nazis and how we don't need to make it up, there's enough of it that really happened, come yeah. find me after the panel. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, what is your opinion on games like Settlers of Catan or Stellaris, if you've played it, that where you're, it explicitly uses the term colonizing? But the um, spaces that are being colonized, the land, the planets, are explicitly also uninhabited. I, That's not possible. <laughs> first off, a lot of parts of the world that we consider barren are in fact peopled, and they have been for a very long time. There is an argument about this on the internet right now on if a place in the Middle East had people on it before some people showed up, and the answer is yes. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't heard of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I must have missed it. I don't know. <laughs> Lucky <laughs> you. Completely new. Completely, never heard it. But in any case, so if, if you're engaging in a place where there is no people, there literally is no people, you're going to a, move, a new planet or whatever, maybe the word colonize is not for you. Maybe the answer is to update your language to reflect the fact that you're all starting off a new place in a new place with nothing maybe don't use the terminology that's been used to oppress. That's my answer. Also, um, can I get my trucker hat? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. The, um, I am also going to go ahead and add that the entire system that we are talking about, when I said, like, viewing land as something to be developed or um, something that is not of um, equivalent worth and value and life as a person is colonial. That is a specific system of thought that is in fact used. It's what has created things like the climate crisis yeah. because there's a lack of respect for land and there's a lack of respect for flora and fauna and people as a whole because we are one. And so like also, again, the reason those games are colonial and the reason they're stale and everyone gets sick of them is because it's the same old, same old that got us here. Yeah. And it's kind of painful after a point. And once you know about it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. Like, you're, you're like, oh, resource extraction, again. Mm -hmm. Like, those games, whether they're inhabited or not, you're still practicing and normalizing resource extraction. Mm -hmm which is part and parcel for settler colonialism and the capitalistic hell that we got here with. That's my feeling, so I'm 
Just mild, you know. <laughs> Just a bit. Um, so I was wondering, um, like, do you have any tips or ideas for like if you're running a campaign, like so I'm running a long-term Pathfinder campaign, and I realize some elements in it have been are like like you were saying, like you know, colonial type like mindsets, and it's like I want to fix that. But I don't want to just be like, like you know, obviously I don't want to use it, but I don't want to just be like, oh, I'm just going to kind of, that never happened. Like, I, I don't know how, like, what do you do when it's like already there and it's like been established for a year and a half and now you realize it's bad and you want to be, I'm the person that can change it. What do I do to address it properly without just getting rid of it and saying it was never a problem? So question back, is this a homebrew or is it straight out of the book? It's out of a book that I am changing, I changed a lot of it already and didn't realize until recently, I was like, oh wait, that should have been changed from the get-go. Uh, you know, right now there's a, a reprint of the uh, Call of Cthulhu book, Horror on the Orient Express, and a friend of mine played in the game of it uh, and messaged me saying, HELP, in all caps. No explanation as to why. To <laughs> it's, the first answer is it's a lot of work, it's a lot of work, and you're going to have to go through whole, the whole book, tag everything that is difficult, and find ways to either get rid of it or replace it with something that is intriguing, but not necessarily repeating the same themes. It takes time, get a notebook, get three. The other thing is, it is, it is impossible to avoid accidentally making mistakes, so retcon them like a television show would. <laughs> Just say, hey, you know, I know that the pantheon that we're using is literally just Catholicism somehow, but with several different gods. Uh, it's the coals, the flames, and the embers. Yeah, Crazy. I know. <laughs> the be but it's not like that anymore. People pray to several different gods. There's temples to several different gods, and they all know each other and talk now. If you didn't know that before, your character has known this for a while. It's almost like the before didn't happen. Sometimes a retcon is the only answer, and that's okay. It's like about the stairs, like the little sister on Family Matters. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, can I have one quick follow-up question? Actually, there's like four. Oh, yeah. three, four. oh I didn't realize that line. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, we've, we've only got like uh, eight minutes, so we'll we're going to keep going. Thank you. Thanks. Um, how can uh, game leaders or players during character creation um, incorporate imaginative diversity in an authentic way? Um, so for example, there are several characters. Okay, we got the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can I do a little, can I be that person to solve promo? Let's go, oh, yeah. Because there's actually a panel about session zero on Sunday that I'm on that you can do. But also, anyone who is a DM, aspiring to be a DM, that is your time to go, here's what we're not gonna do with this table. And, if, and here's the main thing, if someone who is not, let's say, a person of color, wants to be a black character, a character of color, non-human, ask them why. That is the best thing you can do. Communication, surprisingly, is your best weapon in this. Go, well, why do you want your character to be black? What's their background? They start giving you some Pygmalion bullshit where they learn to read and were saved and stuff like that, mm -hmm. then kick them out of your table. That's, or yeah. ask why and say, go, you know what? That's not gonna fly here, absolutely not. Any question I'm sure a lot of you are going to ask is going to be answered by communicate with your players. Rewrite the book. It is a guide. It is not written in stone. It did not come down from the mount. You can rewrite things. There's a thing called homebrew. Just go do it. It's more like guidelines than rules, actually. <laughs> uh, my biggest suggestion for that would be running, using world building games to start your games together. Um, so that it's not just on one person, the DM, to run the whole thing, and then you just do that. Honestly, just like write down 20 questions and then run that you want to answer in your world and then make your players roll, each go around the table one or two times. And then so everyone is on the same, doing the thing with that Tanya just said, like set the boundaries, and then it's like, then we're gonna make the thing together. And once the initial premise is laid out. Check out Microscope. It, I didn't write for it to do anything for it. It's just really good for world building. Very, very crunchy, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so uh, going back to those tropes at the very beginning, the specific ones that everybody's least favorites, uh, do you think there are any good ways to actively subvert those tropes with the intention of challenging the status quo, either as a writer or as a player who maybe encounters these tropes in their games? Rarely, and I, I'm going to just be that person. 
if someone at a table with me is a non-person of color and wants to use slavery, I'm getting up and leaving. Because let's just call it call, call what it is. I don't trust that someone without that experience in their background or has not studied it can subvert it successfully because there's still the cultural marker you're missing. But also, I play to have fun, as Eric said. Why we gotta have slavery in the game? That's not fun. hundred yeah. percent, The people who want to emancipate you know, themselves by playing something horrific and fighting back against it are the people you know, who are on this panel. The people who, you know, you leave it to them. For you, focus, uh, or if there are ones that apply to you, of course, but if, if you're not, focus on trying to create a world where these problems either don't exist or there are aspects of them that can be tagged into when needed. Slavery should never be something that you just start off from the get-go. Mm -hmm. But if you describe a capitalist system and a black person says, I want to fight against slavery, and this is the table for that, and everyone consents, and you have a long discussion about it, well, great, there's now room. It's, remember, <laughs> it's a difficult thing, because the truth of the matter is, sometimes the best answer is just to not. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes the answer from, like, for me, who uh, I, I like to once in a while play an assassin to remind me both of my heritage and how badly they're done. <laughs> sometimes it's about, I want to take this and fight back, but that's because it's coming from me. It's something that I need for myself, the human being, right? Let me do it. Yep. Yes. So. I, yeah. I don't want, if you're going to set that up, I don't like... I'm gonna be like, I don't feel like punching the Nazi today. Like, exactly. yeah, it's, I should be able to, I 100% agree with all that. Also, please, make some religions that aren't Catholicism, please. <laughs> You're <laughs> so uninteresting. God. Uh, okay, so this is actually pretty related to what you were just saying. Um, I am Kanaka Oivi, Na Native Hawaiian. Um, and so I am descended from people, uh, the Pacific Wayfarers, who traveled from Hawaii, navigated the Pacific, and traded with the Chumash, uh, and then went home. Uh, and what my, <laughs> uh, my, my, my question is, um, I am very drawn to uh, discovery and exploration in games, but as a personal thing, acknowledging this is not new, but it's new to me, and it's, it's the, the joy of novelty, the joy of discovery, uh, but every time I pick up a board game or a RPG that promises those elements, it gets soured by, oh no, this is colonialism again. So my question is, uh, do you know of any examples where uh, those themes were explored well? Into the Motherlands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Published by Green Ronin and coming up soon, because we handle this exact topic. But also, uh, I, I struggle to find examples. Uh, my yeah. best solution is, look for others who have similar issues to you, and you may find that they have either recommendations or stories from their own home game that they can tell you about. Because I don't think we've got the time. Yeah, we're a little out of time, but um, I will say, games that focus on the journey, like Wander Home, Mm -hmm. um, you may be able to make your own story where, where you're able to just like kind of live your life and be exploring and have good, like, conflict doesn't always have to be trying to steal people's shit or murder them. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. th that's a thing too. And so you may just make your own where you use a system that has seafaring mechanics, but you just don't actually do the thing where you have to kill an entire island of people and then make it a state and then say it's okay and then have tourists take all the water and maybe we should uh, give Hawaii back. But, <laughs> thank you. That's yeah. going to be our last question, actually, because we're about out of time and I want to make sure that you know where to find all these amazing people. I know we didn't get to everything because this is a big, big topic. This is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of it. So please continue having this conversation, continue educating yourselves. There are books, there are podcasts, there are people doing this work. Hire them, do the thing, reverse order. Eric, where can people find you? Uh, you can find, well today actually, well I'm here on behalf of Multitude, the podcast company that I run. Uh, we have a table at Brandland, which is outside of the Expo Hall. Please just come and hang out and find us. But I'm also the DM of Join the Party. Please uh, come check it out. It's really fun. All my NBCs are Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, historically black society, but only if you're a nigga. This is a nigga's only party. Um, so if you're a black person looking for other black people to game with, come and scan the QR code, join HBB, and hang out with us. 
on uh, just in general, folks can find me on Twitter. I'm at catlady underscore LPC. Mm -hmm. I mostly use that to yell at the government. Don't really talk about games a lot. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find me on there. I'm on Tumblr. I'm on Twitch, even though I don't stream. I'm on, yeah, just look for my name. Dragon Emirates is my gamer tag. Or you can look uh, for me on Twitter at catlady LPC. Tanya. Uh, I'm Cypher Tierboris, C-Y-P-H-E-R-O-F-T-Y-R. Uh, actually, I'm 430 today. I'm doing a cozy chat with the other PTI fellows. PTI is the PAX Together Intersection, a new program through PAX. Cassie is one of them. And we're just going to have a cozy chat about what it means to be a PTI fellow. I was the first uh, for PAX West, and then we have four. We grew uh, for PAX Unplugged. So please support all the fellows that are doing awesome things and panels. Uh, otherwise, you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, Tumblr, probably playing Baldur's Gate, also uh, Hobbs Barrow, and I'm doing way too many things at this con. Just go follow me on Twitter, that's where I'm <laughs> tweeting what I'm doing. Cool. Hello, uh, my tag on the interwebs is Werewolf Feels, literally Werewolf Feels. Don't go to Facebook. Just don't do that. Everyone else, <laughs> Werewolf Feels, uh, if you want to DM me, you're always welcome to. My DMs are open. And uh, other than that, you can find me literally two doors down in about an hour from now, where I'm going to be working with Paizo uh, and doing a Starfinder live play. I'll be playing Raya the Technomancer. Uh, other than that, look for, uh, follow me on Twitter, or follow me on Instagram, or follow me wherever, uh, to find notes on what I'm doing next. And also, just me crying. <laughs> and as mentioned, I am uh, Cassie, also known as Lamia. I have been your moderator panelist of this. Uh, I am a PTI fellow. Uh, you can find me at time uh, in a few hours. <laughs> Whatever time you said, I am also. Four thirty. Thank you. Um, I am also running Dread on Sunday, and then I am on uh, Wrong Answers Only tomorrow night. I am also uh, doing uh, other things. You can find me. It's on the program. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um,